Polanski's film, Knife in the Water, all of these strange, dark, mystical movies involving uh, drugs and sex and killings. Sharon not only didn't use drugs. In the beginning, you know, there were those who thought Roman had an involvement in this. It was conjecture Polanski quickly denied. Terrible for him when he came back for the funeral. And Warren Beatty was telling me this. I mean, people thought he somehow had something to do, which, of course, he didn't. In spite of the obvious similarities between the Tate and LaBianca murders, the police believed that the second crime was merely a copycat incident based on news reports of the first, and the two investigations were run quite separately. During the investigation, the family was actually arrested and then released on an unrelated charge of auto theft. They then headed to the safety of Barker Ranch in Death Valley. On October 10th, the family was rounded up on new charges of auto theft and arson. And while they were in jail, the L.A. murder cases broke open. Family member Susan Atkins was implicated by another member in an earlier crime. Jailed in L.A., she blabbed to cellmates about the Tate and LaBianca murders. The more you kill, the better you like it, she told them. Then one cellmate repeated the stories to the police. In December of 1969, nearly four months after the crimes, Charles Manson and five family members were charged with the Tate and LaBianca murders. What some called the crime of the century would now move on to a trial that would mesmerize a city. The trial of Charles Manson, Pat Krenwinkel, Leslie Van Houten, and Susan Atkins for the Tate and LaBianca murders began on June 15, 1970. Manson demanded and was refused permission to serve as his own attorney. Still, from the beginning, it was clear that Manson was in complete control of the defense. You have to realize that uh, I viewed Manson as being the main defendant. Uh, to convict his co-defendants and have him walk out of court, I think, would have been an unsuccessful prosecution. Uh, the problem was that Manson was not at the murder scene. He did not physically participate in these murders. So I had to bring him in by way of circumstantial evidence. Uh, and also by the law of conspiracy. At the heart of the prosecution effort was the bizarre story of Helter Skelter, the stranger-than-fiction doomsday scenario that Charles Manson had woven from his earlier certainty of a coming race war. Helter Skelter was a name he'd taken from a Beatles song. Manson envisioned that white people would turn against the black man if they thought the black man had committed these seven murders and ultimately there would be a civil war between blacks and whites out on the street. During the war, he told him, he said, we're going, to hide about, we're, we're going to hide out in the bottomless pit in the desert, a place he derived from Revelation 9, a, a chapter in the last book of the New Testament. Manson foresaw that the black man would win this war, but later on he said the black man, because of inexperience, would simply not be able to handle the reins of power, so we would have to look around at those white people who had survived, who had escaped from Helter Skelter. And he said, we'll come out of the bottomless pit, and quoting Manson, we'll send Blackie on his way to pick him cotton, and we'll take over the leadership of the world. The chief prosecution witness was Linda Kasabian, who had driven the car on the night of the Tate murders. She agreed to testify in return for immunity. Can you get out of our way? The mood around the trial and throughout L.A. was as bizarre as the accused themselves. It may be more than six months before the Tate case finally goes to trial here at the Hall of Justice, but Hollywood isn't waiting. Two movies about the mass murders already are in the works. One producer said his film will concentrate on the hippie clan charged with murder and explain on the screen why they might have done it. Day after day, Manson would come into court and by turns intimidate and amuse. He was playing the, the people. He was playing to the courtroom. He was playing to the, to the press. We had quite a few staring sessions. He was always staring at people, you know, he'd stare at, at the jury and they would turn away. He'd turn around and stare at spectators. During the trial, as in their lives before, the three women took all their instructions from Manson. The entire proceedings were scripted by Charlie. Every day we'd meet and he'd decide, well, today I want you each to stand up and hold your hands in some stupid symbols. You're going to get up and scream. You know, each day was scripted. And that day we proceeded through the events. With Manson, he believed that everything we did was creating some picture that was going to go out in the universe and somehow change it towards his, bend it towards his will. 
The daily march of Van Houten, Atkins, and Krenwinkel, smiling and singing, was unnerving to anyone who saw it on the news. The song they were singing was one that Manson had written. After disrupting the proceedings a number of times, the rest of the family was banned from the courtroom, so they moved to the hallways and kept a vigil outside. At first, the mood was almost festive. We saw them every day, you know. Come on, Squeaky, uh, you can't really be serious about that, you know. And we would banter back and forth, and so there was a joviality. But continuing to shock the courtroom, Manson carved an X into his forehead in late July to symbolize his removal from society. The following weekend, the three girls followed suit. National attention on the trial included unwelcome notice from the highest level. President Nixon spoke of Charles Manson in a speech on August 3rd. Here is a man who was guilty, uh, directly or indirectly, of eight murders without reason. Uh, here is a man yet who, as far as the coverage was concerned, uh, appeared to be rather a glamorous figure. And the next day, a smiling Charles Manson held the headline up to the jury as the defense demanded a mistrial. It was denied in spite of the defense team's best efforts. The President of the United States says somebody's guilty. What recourse do you have? You answer the question. Inside the courtroom, the most dramatic moment occurred on October 5, 1970, when Manson lunged 10 feet towards the judge. He was restrained, and the trial continued. Uh, it certainly was within earshot. On November 16th, the prosecution rested, and the defense rested without calling a single witness. Struggles with Manson and changes in the defense team were constant. But there was still alarm when defense lawyer Ronald Hughes did not show up in court. His body was later discovered in a wilderness area. One ex-family member has since claimed he was murdered for disagreeing with Manson over Leslie Van Houten's defense. On January 25, 1971, after nine days of deliberation, the jury found each defendant guilty of conspiracy to commit murder and murder in the first degree. In a separate trial, Tex Watson was also found guilty and sentenced to death. In the penalty phase of the trial, the women did testify and tried to exonerate Manson. And now the instructions from Manson were changing. One of the things that Charlie always promoted about himself was, I don't lie. And all of a sudden, he was asking every one of us to lie on a daily basis about something. Oh, say this, say that. And we're going, but I didn't do that. And it was like, you lie, a god lies. <laughs> On March 9th, the jury called for the death penalty for all four defendants, a finding the judge then upheld. In protest, the women shaved their heads. Before that clerk reads that verdict, you don't know what he's gonna say, life or death. It's a very tense, suspenseful moment. And uh, I looked over at Manson and his hands were uh, trembling. Now here's, a, here's someone who always spoke about the beauty of death. I was always telling everyone, death is a beautiful thing, and maybe when we kill these people, we're doing them a favor, and they don't even realize it. But I was with him for nine and a half months, and he fought very hard for his own life, see? So that was just pure hypocrisy on his part. The defendants faced the death penalty now. To at least one of them, it was a kind of relief. I was more than willing to go to the gas chamber. I didn't fear it. The death penalty for me at the time seemed, it almost justified my not having to deal with what I had done. It was the eye for an eye. They're going to kill me. I don't have to deal with it. And then in 1972, the Supreme Court overturned the death penalty. Death sentences were commuted to terms of life imprisonment. In the case of Charles Manson, there was a certain irony involved. In fact, he told me after, after the trial, but Yossi says, you know, you haven't achieved anything here. He said, all you've done is send me back to where I came from. But I said, well, yeah, Charlie, that's true. But as far as I know, you've never been in the green room before. The, the green room is, is, is a reference to San Quentin uh, um, gas chamber. The next year, I was driving my car, and the car radio was on. 